Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon. And as you know, I'm your host and your guide. And our job is to help you get off the brink. And that's not always so easy. So I go looking for people who are gonna help you do three things. Can you see in a new way, fresh lens? Can you feel it? Remember, we decide with the heart and the eyes. And then can you think about mm, the problem you may have or the issue you may want or something that is really a trigger for you in a way that can help you actually do it? So I don't want to skip the action part, but today I really am delighted to have Laura Rada with us. And she's smiling and you're going to smile at listening to her talk about her own journey, but also about help she helps people see, feel, and think in new ways. Because at the end of the day, we live our story as it is today. And we think that's reality, but it's just an illusion. And that illusion is taking care of us, but not necessarily taking us to where we'd like to go. And she's going to talk about how she helps people pause and rethink her story, their story, so they can begin to move somewhere new. The question is, what's the problem to solve? It's not as if we have solutions. And she and I both approach women with the same kind of question. Let's really get what matters to you. And what I find often is that they don't quite know. And then what's the real problem with getting that going? They don't know much about that either. A little bit about Laura. Um, she's founder of True Abundance Advisors. Don't you love the name of that firm? A financial life planning and wealth management firm. Her mission is to empower midlife professionals to use their money as a tool to create more freedom and flexibility. And she's passionate about sharing her expertise to guide her clients toward decisions that integrate the attainment of both financial security and life satisfaction. This is financial well-being, and it isn't just wealth, it's well-being, it's a sense of purpose. So we're going to be talking a lot about being present, encouraging gratitude, which is, I'm actually writing an article about gratitude. Gratitude improves our well-being in such important ways, clarity and abundance. Laura, I'm so delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Andy. I'm so excited to be here. Why don't you share with our audience, who's Laura? What's your journey been like? Let's you know, begin to get them for, if those who just listen, they need to hear your story. And those who are watching, they're gonna enjoy your telling your story. So who are you and tell us about yourself. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to share my story. So I'm a career changer. I had a close to 30 year career on Wall Street. I always like to joke that I started when I was 12. <laughs> you may have. <laughs> <laughs> and as I look back on that career, I really see it in thirds. So the first 10 years of my career were amazing. I loved what I did. I had been a nerd, let's say, in, a, in high school and a bit in college. And then when I began to work as an analyst, um, looking at companies and deciding whether or not um, I thought it was worthwhile to invest in them, I found something, a career that was intellectually challenging, um, that I was good at, and that, you know, frankly, paid me a nice amount of money. And so it became um, my definition of who I was. Um, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're, you're looking for that identity. And my work as an analyst on Wall Street gave me that identity. I had been an English lit major in college, um, specifically <laughs> because I find that when you read books, um, you know, as an anthropologist, you're, you're becoming aware of what's the political environment, what's the economic environment, yes. what's the backdrop of that story. Well, being I was what was called a generalist on Wall Street, I didn't um, work on a one specific industry. It was always learning new industries and there too, what's affecting the industry, what's going on in the environment, economically, politically, that's having an impact. And so I really love what I did for the you first You sound time. like a curious George. <laughs> <laughs> I often think of ourselves as curious Georges. We can't get enough. That's fascinating. What can I learn more? Exactly. And that was the first 10 years. So yeah. now you've hit whatever, and now you're going into the next stage. What happened? So the next stage, I had three children, all in diapers under the age of three, which could be a whole other discussion. 
I was, for both financial and characterological reasons, the primary breadwinner, not the primary caregiver. My husband became Dr. Mom, but still, it was quite a busy household. When I wasn't working, I was involved in childcare. I was busy. I was raising my children. I don't really remember thinking that much about what I did. I took it for granted. I was supporting the family. Yes. The last 10 years of my career, so let's say early 2000s through 2013, I hated what I did. I was miserable. Oh. First of all, the industry itself had shifted from the nerds in high school, as I said, who discovered that they could do something intellectually challenging and make money. Now it was more and more the frat boys in college who realized they could leverage their relationships into making money. It frankly became all about making money. Yes. And the economic environment had shifted so that, you know, as interest rates were <laughs> lower, um, you had a, everybody was chasing the same ideas for a lot of risk and not a lot of reward. And I was bored. I didn't, sh I didn't share the values of the people I worked with. I was miserable. But I had a story, right? I had a story that I need to earn a certain amount of money. And practically, I had put a, a lot of overhead in place in, in my household. We had a 6,000 square foot house on an acre of land. We had a vacation home. I had three kids in private school and camp, and we took fancy vacations. I, um, I really had become trapped by the life I had created for myself. And around that time, I started to find mindfulness practices. Ah. I began to practice yoga. <clears throat> um, I started to meditate. And it, it slowly occurred to me that like, oh, I'm not gonna get a do-over to my life. This is it. <laughs> and that I myself was <clears throat> creating a story of victim you know, that I had no choice in my life, that I was a victim of my life. And so then I had an extraordinary occurrence. I, I took a day off to go to a silent meditation retreat. I actually found the journal in which I wrote an entry as I commuted into the city the next day saying, I'm not going to be a victim of my life. I was uh, working for Citigroup at the time, and I had decided I was going to approach my boss and say, you know, make some suggestions for, you know, changing the morning meeting, changing the way we discussed investment opportunities so that I felt more engaged and I was no longer, you know, just pushing my way through. Well, Andy, I don't know if it was that same day, but perhaps, you know, a day or so later, my boss called me into his office and said that there was a group wide layoff, not for cause. And um, I was given a very nice severance package and um, told Goodbye. that I, my services were no longer needed. And I just want to share one more thing about that. So I within that week, I accidentally fell down the stairs, like tripped down the stairs at home and just started bawling. And my husband said, Laura, this is what you've been looking forward to. You've been wanting to leave, but you just couldn't bring yourself to do it. And I looked at him and I said, this has been my identity for close to 30 years. You're a smart woman. This is who you were. I mean, you can hold both. And I was excited to have an opportunity to recreate. Yes. And at the same time, I was terrified. Who am I? No. Yeah. All Who of a sudden you're naked. Exactly. No. So I explored, um, I had a book like 90 Days to a New Life Direction. I explored becoming a yoga teacher. I actually did a yoga teacher training, but I decided with my tight hamstrings, that was, you know, not my life's mission. I did uh, interview several friends who had become rabbis later in life. I have a very strong spiritual yearning. 
Um, and they all loved going to school and, you know, writing papers. And that really wasn't drawing me. <laughs> so um, you're exploring. I love the story. <laughs> I'm so glad you're sharing it. I can't, I'm watching your face and I'm saying, this is really a journey others need to listen to. And the next part? The next part was becoming a financial advisor to women. I didn't quite know what that meant. Um, I informational interviewed and ended up being uh, asked to join an already existing wealth management firm, uh, which I did for a um, little under two years. And there I learned what financial planning was and how much I really loved working mm -hmm. with individuals. I also realized that I wanted to create a firm in my own image that um, had a specific way I wanted to work with people, as I mentioned to you, a specific client I wanted to work with, um, specifically midlife professional women who similar to me were either kicked out from or burnt out by their corporate jobs and had this sense that there was more meaning and purpose to life than they had been able to feel and to help them use their money to align their you know, to align with meaning. And so in, I think it was June, July, 2016, I named my firm True Abundance Advisors and hung out a shingle. I love it. Started the work I do today. That is just a great story. The, the, I want to emphasize a couple of parts that touch my heart, which is, um, I, I, did you have a, any support along the way or was this all your self-awareness as you began to reflect on who you are and who you were? Um, because you had a good husband, I'm assuming. Mine has always been my, my support, but he couldn't decide for me. I mean, I'm in business 20 years. And, and when I said to him, I'm going into my own business, he looked at me and said, okay, what are you going to be? And I said, I don't know. So I found a PR firm who I love. And John Roska said, Andy, you're a corporate anthropologist. Yeah, it helps companies change. And I said, bingo. There wasn't anybody looking for that. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know anybody who was searching for me. I picked up four clients right away. But to your point, though, we need to know who we are. And, and I always look to John. I can see him saying those words to me because it was as if he had a mirror and he went, ah, bingo. That's who you are. But and without my husband, I never could have been there. Did you have a support base for this? I'm always wondering whether women look for outsiders or afraid to trust. How, how, did, how did the journey go all alone? Um, I, I, I agree with you, Andy. There's no journey that's all alone. Um, and so many things come up as you ask me the question. The first support I have to say is um, a yoga teacher I found um, because that really opened me up to listening to that still small voice inside that I don't think I ever truly listened to in the same way. Um, also, when I was working for the other financial planning firm, I found a group called the Alliance of Comprehensive Planners, who both taught a methodology of financial planning, as well as a flat annual retainer fee, not taking commissions for selling product, yes. um, not necessarily even um, managing money. So not charging an asset under management fee, though I do manage money, but I, I really wanted to be agnostic as yes. to, I just wanted to work on my client's behalf and not have any conflicts of interest. And finally, I do want to um, shout out my husband. Uh, starting this entrepreneurial journey, I don't want anyone to have the idea that I hung out a shingle and then life just took off and I never <laughs> does. Right. Um, it's always a series of peaks and valleys. And there was a time, there aren't that many women in the financial services industry in general, and certainly not in my part of the business. And I was approached by several firms to consider joining them as an advisor. And it was during a low point where I felt like, well, maybe it would be good to have, you know, uh, know how much money is coming in each year with some little incentive to bring more clients in. And I remember taking a walk with my husband. He has, frankly, always been more anxious about money than I am. And I told him that I was considering I was in the middle of interviewing, um, joining another firm. And he looked at me, Andy, and said, 
this is the most creative you've been in your entire professional life. You're discovering you yourself. You're, yes. Like, why would you leave that for like yes. certainty oh. of oh. income? And I get chills because I really felt responsible to him. You know, I, I rocked his world by walking away from the income I was earning when I worked on Wall Street. And um, it wasn't easy. And um, I really appreciate that he recognized your husband and mine should get to know each other at one point because they could share notes on their crazy wives who they love dearly and they'll do anything and, and I, I i often go back my husband refused to allow me to not finish my phd and he sat there while i read this awful document i had written and without a copy editor and he and i went through this <laughs> whole big dissertation and i got my doctorate but i must say without his enthusiasm i'm not quite sure i wouldn't have walked away and said ah, yuck and then he encouraged me to take my daughter's to greece to do more research i don't know they were four and five years old and i took my two kids on a plane to go study greek women oh, wow. and he said go for it. you know you can't do it in life without a go for it person right and, and it takes it from um, that, that, so it's, and it's the same for these midlife crises women. I mean, I, I, I and I, the ones that worry me the most are the solos who don't have another, I become their other. And we become remarkably uh, important to each other, me to listen and provide encouragement in them to begin to craft that new them in a way that matters to someone and as I watch them transform, I suspect you see the same, I, I get such a joy because I don't do anything except help them see themselves through a fresh lens. And all of a sudden they go, whoosh, and then they, and then they call back and we need a little more time. Okay, whoosh. And, and, and it's, it is most gratifying. So is there a particular approach that you take? Um, because while you talk about it in terms of financial well-being, it sounds like it's more inclusive of their life journey as well. Do you use your own experience to help them do the same? Or is it most particularly around just, it's not wealth management, it doesn't sound like. It is wealth management, but that's a piece of overall, you know, financial clarity and organization. Um, it's a good question, Andy. So um, I want to say that I feel privileged that most of the time, look, people don't pick up a phone and call a complete stranger to, to talk about their money unless there is some life transition that they're going through. <clears throat> and often I'll get a phone call, and I think you said this earlier in the introduction, people don't even know what they need. You know, I came into this inheritance or I have this severance payment or, a, and like, what do I do with the money? Yes. You know, and that's the question that people have. And so I feel like I create a safe space yes. to ask questions and guide a journey that they're not otherwise asked or they're not otherwise considering. When I first meet someone, even before they become a client, I ask the question, what about money is important to you? Mm -hmm. You know, take a step back and reflect, what have you made it again as an anthropologist? What's the story? What have you made money represent? Yes. And it's important to recognize mm -hmm. that to begin with. Um, I find cash flow, once we do start to work together, is a very, very important part of the work we do. And before I even look at the cash flow, we do a values exercise. I have 14 different values cards, broad topics with, you know, little lines underneath, such as, you know, community, family, philanthropy, work, what, you know, 14 different areas of life and choose the four or five that you believe that you live your life by. Yeah. And now let's look at how you're spending money. And of course, there's never going to be always a direct correlation, but you want there to be some correlation between what you think guides your life vision and how you're actually using. You know, we have, we have scarce resources. Money is a scarce resource. Time is a scarce resource. Energy is a scarce resource. And we're all more aware of it since the, the pandemic started. Oh, absolutely. But and, I think you're absolutely right. You know, what matters? And you need a process for digging into it. Because if you ask the question, they go, duh, <laughs> as if they live every day. Not quite sure. 
That's really cool. And, and keep going though. I don't want to interrupt your flow because it's <laughs> a most interesting one. Yes. So I think a values exercise is really important. I also do, um, I didn't uh, start this. There's a gentleman, George Kinder, known as the father of financial life planning. And he has the three questions. And these are, you know, if you learned you had a year left to live, you otherwise will feel fine, but you don't know when your last day is. Would you change your life? And if so, how? Yes. Um, and drilling down to the third question is, if you find out that this is your last day, what would you regret not accomplishing? Mm -hmm. And um, these are just questions for me to understand what are the important things for this particular person I'm getting to know. And, and just as importantly, for them to understand, you know, yes. what would you be missing? What is important to you to move forward on? And I use these kind of questions to frame the journey, the plan going forward. Now, specifically for people in a big life transition, I, I do belong to um, an organization called the Financial Transitionist. And it's also very important, you know, I've just started to work with someone who's had a big award from a settlement to take a deep breath, to not everything needs to be done right away. Often, I'm, I mean, I'll do a thought bubble exercise and just like, what are you worrying about and what's coming up and put together a document with all the thought bubbles and, and all the questions that come up and to define, this is what we need to take care of now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's say we're laid off. Do you still have life insurance? Where are you getting your health insurance? You know, the now. These things, we don't have to address them right now. They can be soon. Yes, you just got a big life-changing settlement. Let's not rush to buy something, a new house, a new place to live. Let's take a deep breath and take our time. And this could be dealt with later. It's very important because people tend to get overwhelmed by the financial decisions they believe they need to make. And especially in a big life transition to to help people feel like you're okay, yes. you're okay. Yes. As I would say, my yoga teacher hat, you're being held. Yes. I, every time I approach a meeting, I, I remind myself I'm holding a safe space for people because money is, is a tough, is a tough topic. It is, and it is, and, and change is equally tough. Yes. So you add the catalytic moments, the transitions and the money question together and um, people are not comfortable with the lack of certainty. And they really would prefer to know if it's a, one box or a different box, but no box is most anxiety producing. And, and you become that box that moves them from, oh, I'm scared to death to, oh, I can at least hold the boxes for a moment and begin to move forward um, with somebody to guide me. And, and, and in some ways, that's okay. It's okay to have a guide. You don't need to do it alone. And you'll need someone who you trust. Um, yeah. Because having somebody who is a financial planner who we lost trust in, that is not good. And now we have someone who is extremely trusting um, but it is also an interest, as I'm listening to you, interesting to think about what do we value? Does he share that? And it's one thing to get great returns in the markets today, but it's also a good time to think through what are we investing in and why? And, and what, what really matters? I must tell you, I could keep talking to you for a long time. Most of <laughs> you're an inspiration to me as I'm listening to you. Um, and and uh, having gone through some catalytic moments myself alone, <laughs> Um, I remember that feeling, um, and you've come out of this really on a high, to your husband's point, you've created something of great value for yourself and those who you take care of. So I'm in awe of what you're doing. A couple of things, Laura, for, well, it's time to wrap up. So let's give the audience one or two things you don't want them to forget. As they're thinking about their own lives, you know, what is it that Laura brings to you, my audience here, that you, you know, want to remember? Some thoughts? Um, I'm not sure if this is a financial question or a mindset question, so I'm going to answer it from the mindset point of view, um, which is, first of all, our values are always shifting. It's not like I look back at, you know, my time on Wall Street and regret it in any way. 
what was important to me when raising a family, when young, when building my financial yes. resources um, shifts over time. And as we age, we have a greater sense of the legacy we want to leave and what 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 the meaning of our lives is that's quite different in our 20s than it is in our 50s and older. So um, I guess then I would ask our listeners to consider their North Star. What are the values that they live by at this time? Not judging what you did in the past, not worrying about what you're going to do in the future, but um, presence. Actually, I was learning with um, someone who works for the Financial Transitionist Institute who said all the exercises we do with our clients at the end of the day, it's all about presence. Yes. And um, you so sound like my, yes, you sound like my mindfulness um, video <laughs> that I listen to as I try to go to sleep at night. And I find that whether it's meditation or mindfulness, but that so story is exactly the story. Yesterday, all has been done is done. Tomorrow it hasn't come yet. Right now, be in the moment. And it's okay to have a presence in the moment um, while you're you know, moving into the next day. And so as we were talking, I'm saying to myself, I, 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 I really love that. It leaves me with this feeling like it is okay. Just be in the moment. It's okay. But it is a, a real interesting time for all of us. And as you think about the folks that you're helping, um, they, they are better because of the collaboration with you. And it isn't as if you do and they get, it's together we become better. Hmm. Yes, and I do wanna make sure that I mention, I find that women often as a generalization more than men have a lot of blocks around money. I mean, I, I work with couples where the women are the primary breadwinner and yet feel insecure about the understanding about money. And so um, on my website, I do have um, an exercise you can access um, to unblock your money blocks. It's a cute name, but it has a lot of advice for, again, mindset issues, how to think about your money and a way to move forward. That's worth another podcast because <laughs> it is, you know, when you work with women entrepreneurs, um, as we uh, uh, often do, um, they're, they're proud of the fact they've grown their business without any outside capital. And we get irritated that the venture capitalists only give 2.8% of their money to women. But the women have a mindset that said, you know, if Sarah Blakely can celebrate the fact that Spanx grew without any venture capital money, wow. came out of, uh, and you know, that's a standard of that I hear women tell me all the time. I didn't do it. I didn't need, I didn't have to give it away to grow it. I grew it. And it's if, we should change the standards a bit. And I can I can do it, mom, all by myself. You know, just watch <laughs> me here. And that is a, a, a female story that I hear over and over again. When you talk to them about getting outside capital, they, you know, and as opposed to, well, they wouldn't give it to me anyhow, there's an anger, but, but and, and how do I, there's a whole world there about women and, and that money. Um, but they do really well in the market. Women really are very good at saving and investing and growing and sometimes exactly. spending too. <laughs> We're not chasing the latest, greatest, sexy investment idea. No. A, a guaranteed well, recipe. You know, and we also think about legacy though. What do we leave for others and how does it have an impact? And those are important. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. I'm so delighted that you came on. I'm glad that Business Council of Westchester gave us an opportunity to <laughs> It's been so much fun. Laura, the, if we will put onto the blog that we write with the podcast where they can reach you, but you might want to tell the little listeners how to best get a hold of you. Um, well, you can check out my website, True Abundance Advisors with an O um, dot com. And my email address is Laura, L A U R A, at True Abundance Advisors, A D V I S O R S dot com. And you're also on LinkedIn. And of course, on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter. Who isn't on LinkedIn, I wonder? But I know some people who are, but LinkedIn has become <laughs> our, our directory of directories. It's been a fun time today. I hope our listeners and viewers appreciate the wisdom that Laura has brought, both with her life journey. The experiences are not uncommon, but sometimes you need a, a story to show you the way out. And that's just what we've had today. Now, 
For all of you who come from across the globe, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Remember, my book is here for you to help you transition as well. And the first book, On the Brink, that won an award, um, is all about how to see, feel, and think in new ways for your business. A little anthropology can help you grow. And Rethink, Smashing the Myths for Women in Business is all about women, perhaps like Laura as well, who simply said, of course I can, and refused to accept the barriers or boundaries of the myths that say women can't, women don't. You're going to find some great stories in there to inspire you, whether you're a guy or a gal. And I hope you stay well, stay healthy, and enjoy whatever it is you're doing, because the times, they are changing. And please <laughs> stay in the moment. It's a great time to just focus on the joy for the minute. Hey, thanks again. Bye-bye now.